verse 25 and 26, Jesus said to her, said to Martha, I am the resurrection and I am the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And that was the question that Jesus was asking Martha. The word resurrection, I'm bringing this out of the Greek, it literally means to rise from the dead and to raise the dead. So when Jesus made the statement, I am the resurrection, he was saying to her, I am, I have the power to raise again. But I also have the power right now to, to raise the dead. I'm going to rise, but the dead's going to be raised also. And so when he was making that appointment, he, that, that statement, he's saying, I'm the resurrection. Then he says, and I am the life. Because it is one thing to know that Jesus is the resurrection. But it's another thing that knows that he's the life. I think sometimes in church, in these moments, in these special days, I know we look, of course, to the resurrection of the Lamb, and it was the same thing that Martha basically told Jesus when, when Jesus makes the statement. She says, well, I know that in the end time, when you come again, that we will rise from the dead. And that's what many Christian people, when they think of the resurrection and they think of that word, they think, well, praise God, he rose from the dead and one day we're going to rise from the dead. But I got news for you. He's the resurrection right now. And that's the point Jesus was making. I'm not just the resurrection that's going to happen. I'm the, I am the life. The word life, this is in the Greek, life real and genuine, a life active and vigorous, devoted to God, blessed in the portion, even in this world, of those who put their trust in Christ. Basically what Jesus was saying, I am the resurrection and I'm the resurrection now. And so I want to talk just this morning on just really about Mary and Martha, lessons we can learn from this where the resurrection is concerned, and how can we walk in that resurrection life? Mary and Martha, their home in Lazarus was about two miles in Bethany. It was two miles from Jerusalem. Jesus calls Lazarus his friend. It's interesting. Many scholars believe that Jesus spent much time uh, in the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus because of their hospitality. They are not referred to as disciples, but yet we know they were disciples of Jesus. But Luke chapter 10, it's very interesting, and, and we're going, I'm going to uh, give you some, some keys here that I believe uh, where really when we're talking about living the resurrection life, it is understanding, number one, is the power of his word. Luke chapter 10, to bring you up to the place, how many have ever heard a sermon on it's better to be a Mary than a Martha? Anybody ever heard messages? At any time, you know, are you a Martha or a Mary? You hear all these, these messages on that, but when we really look at what Jesus was saying, it's really not about comparing Martha to Mary. It really is about the time. There's a time to sit, there's a time to serve. And that's the point. And so what, what happened here, when you go into Luke chapter 10, you really begin to build the story as it moves into their home. Now, Jesus calls 70 of his disciples. He calls them together in Luke chapter 10. He, he puts them in pairs of two. So you've got 35 groups here, 35 teams. And then he says, I give you authority to go out, raise the dead. He said, go out and heal in my name. I'm giving you my authority. He said, I want you to minister to the sick. I want you to raise the dead. I want you to go out and do everything that I've done. You now have the power to do it. Now, so these guys, I mean, he gave them, and then he said, now go. Go into the harvest. 
and he, he gave them certain instructions to do. So these guys had gone out for several days, and they had come back. And can you imagine? Those guys were just basically going ballistic. Man, guess what happened? Man, there's this guy, he's laying on the street, he's completely blind. We just went up there and said, in the name of Jesus, sight come. And sight, and he's running around and just praising God. And the one said, oh, that's nothing, man. You should have heard what happened over here. These guys were just elated. Wouldn't you have loved to have been at the campfire that night? Wow. I mean, the testimonies were through the roof. And you've got 35 teams telling all the great things. We don't know whether, whether Mary and Martha were there at the time, yet we do know that women traveled with Jesus. Jesus didn't send out Mary and Martha. At the time, he only sent the men. The women were there to serve and to help. So there's no doubt that already before Mary ever sat at Jesus' feet, that there was something stirring in that young lady's heart. Some believe that she was the Mary that seven demons were cast out of. There was something that burned. I don't doubt that for sure they heard the testimonies. And there is no doubt that in her heart she's thinking, man, why didn't I get to go? I know I have my place, and I know this is not the culture. And that was the Jewish culture at that time. But she goes, oh, my goodness. Oh, man, my heart is on fire for him and his love. Let me tell you something about the heart for Jesus. It'll cross every culture in the world. God doesn't look at culture. He looks at our heart and the, pure, the pureness of our heart. So Jesus and the whole posse, I mean the whole group, start heading to Martha and Mary's house. Now, what would you, ladies, what would you be thinking? I, I know what you'd be thinking. You'd get your husbands in line real quick. We got to do this. We got to do that. We got to get re ready here. Now, I want you to watch this because they begin to come in Luke chapter 10 verse 38 Jesus and the disciples continued on the journey they came to the village where a woman uh, welcomed Jesus into her home her name was Martha and her sister was Mary now it says here Mary sat down attentively before the master absorbing every revelation he shared now in the atmosphere there was revival. I mean revival. It wasn't just Jesus healing the sick. Now he had 35 teams. And we don't know how many people Martha let in her home. Martha and Lazarus and Mary all lived in that home. So Martha is, she's looking and going, oh my gosh. Uh, and how many know you just can't run down to Walmart in those days? So her mind is, man, I mean, she is thinking, she is adjusting. You know, it's interesting. They, evidently, they had a nice home. Probably they had some wealth. They, they did not live with their parents. It was a home big enough to hold many of the disciples. We don't know how many, many was in there. But there is no doubt that Mary was involved in the cleaning and the cooking, and finally they all get in there. Jesus is seated. The disciples are seated around the floor. That's the way they did to their rabbi. They gave full honor to Jesus as their rabbi. And so he is seated up here. He is teaching. Mary's in the kitchen. And all her ear is tuned into is what Jesus was saying what the disciples were testifying about. And her heart burned so much, I want you to listen to it, she bypassed culture and went in and sat at his feet as a disciple. 
And let me tell you, that was not done. And there's, there's probably a few disciples who are going, wow, what's she doing down there? It doesn't make any difference what color we are, what race we are, whether we're male or female. Do y'all know there's no male and female in heaven? And what God looks at right now is just really our heart toward him. Now, Martha's Martha. She's got the full responsibility. And so this, this, is, this is really another thing that was never done is that Martha's busy. She looks in there, and there is her sister sitting at his feet. She wasn't acknowledging how hungry she was for Jesus. No, it was the fact, I'm feeding all these people, and you're in there, and you're not helping me. And she burst in the middle of this and totally sucked the oxygen right out of the room. I mean, everybody was like, <gasps> And listen to what she says. But Martha became exasperated with finishing the numerous household chores and the preparation for her guests. And so she interrupted Jesus and said, Lord, don't you think it's unfair that my sister left me to do all this work by myself? One translation said, Lord... Don't you care? No, no one, none of you have ever said that. I know that. You know, only me, you know. Left this work to do by myself, and should you not tell her, please tell her to get up and help me. Now, Jesus... Man, he could have tore into her, but he chose not to. And he says this, the Lord answered, and I'm sure it was just in a very soothing voice. Martha, oh, my beloved Martha, why are you so upset and troubled, pulled away by all these many distractions? Mary has discovered the one thing most important by choosing to sit at my feet. She is undistracted, and I won't take this privilege from her. Again, I think sometimes we, we, we taught on don't be a, a, a Martha but a Mary. But again, Jesus uses the word distraction. And what it is, he was not rebuking Martha, but he was helping her to understand everybody. There's a time to sit, and there's a time to serve. And in this time, why? Because Jesus wasn't going to be there much longer. And there's a time to sit. There's a time to focus. There's always, you're always going to be doing things for God and moving and they're both important. And believe me, in, in my ministry and all, I know the difference between sitting and serving. There's a time to sit and there's a time to serve. When I remember, gosh, I was thinking about this the other day, when the, the church was built over in uh, West Little Rock, Agape, and uh, the church was built debt-free, and my responsibility, I remember when, when uh, the pastor called me in, and, man, he's the visionary, he's going, we're going to do this, and we're going to do this, and we're going to do that, and we're going to do this. And I'm sitting there thinking, yeah, and I know who we is. Because on, you know, Monday morning, he's going to call we into his office, and this is what we got to do. I felt like getting a T-shirt saying my name is we because I was responsible for it. I mean, we had, uh, and that bottom floor would hold 2,000 people. So you're talking about laying a, con we had a concrete slab. We had sheetrock. I had to be up there every Saturday. We had to get everything ready for the service. They gave us an occupancy permit, and it was just, it was wild. And there was, there was nothing but sheetrock on the wall, 
And, of course, we were a faith church, and, and that's because I believe everybody heard the message about eight times because of the echo problem. He'd go, thank you, Jesus, 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 hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. That was, that was the way it is. And so my responsibility, man, I had, we had to get in there. We, the, the workers would work. Sheetrock dust was ever there. All over the place, we had to throw this stuff out, and we had to sweep this stuff. And, and I was in charge of Monday night intercessory prayer, and I got kind of... Uh, I got kind of tickled one day because the, these individuals came to me and they said, oh, Brother Terry, we just, the Shagana glory cloud is all over you. And I said, for real? Oh, yeah. I said, that's sheetrock dust. I said, I tell you what, meet me and I'm going to put the, I'm going to put brooms in your hands and we can sweep ourselves into the Holy of Holies. You know, you know, it's funny. But what Jesus was making the point, at that time, it was time to serve. I mean, we were working so hard, and when I find, found a group of guys standing over here, and they were talking about the next revelation they had and this and that, I used to walk over to them and just kind of put my arms around them, and I said, I love you guys. I know Jesus is real, but it's time to work. And I said, we can talk about the Bible after we finish. And so, don't, now, don't, don't look at me time to work it is there there's a time to sit there's a time to work and I want to say this right now the the Holy Spirit moves in seasons and there is no question it's time to sit because you know what God's getting us ready to work and before you can work with the faith and the confidence you have to learn how to sit that is why Jesus would not rebuke Mary. He uses the word distraction, and we can see four major things about distraction. They all, all start with D. Number one is the disbelief that Martha showed. Don't you care? When we start getting distracted in our relationship with the Lord, and the things that are going around us. And look, it is so easy. We live in a, you know, we live in a world of chaos. Never before in history have we experienced the chaos. It's on the news every day. It's blasted everywhere it goes. Everybody talks about the chaos. Very few can talk about the answer to the chaos. And we as the church, we have the answer. God knows that, and it is Jesus. What we have to do right now, are we saying, don't you care? <laughs> I can't tell you times in my life with everything. I walked out on my back porch and go, you know, am I supposed to take this? You know, yes. And you learn you do care. I'm never going to question that. But what's happening is we're getting distracted. Moves us into disbelief. The next, defensive. We get defensive. Martha was like, my sister has left me completely alone. When we get defensive, how many know it's all about us? No one is helping me. Why isn't there anybody helping me? And the next, it comes demands. Tell her, Jesus, if you really love me, tell that woman to get up and get in here and help me. Then the last is just total, complete desperation. And when we get to that point because of distractions, what happens, desperation starts controlling atmospheres. And it changes the atmosphere of love. You know, she actually changed that atmosphere that fast. So I want to make, you know, a, sta a, a statement here 
desperation control the atmosphere through your complaining when in this world of chaos in this world of not knowing what's going to happen when we wake up what's going to happen in the 24 hour period we have to recognize and i've been really sharing this and because the lord's really challenged my own heart that every morning the minute i get up that i say father you created this day completely for me and you had me in mind god had every one of you in my in his mind this morning when you got up before time was ever created god saw you he created this day this moment this exact time just for you and all the crucifixion the resurrection and the love is directed completely toward you hallelujah that'll resurrect you then we move into the power of worship it is the word mary tuned her ears into the teaching of jesus and nothing was going to distract her i I understand we got a lot of work to do but in this moment there is no question jesus looked at her with the love in his eyes Again, breaking all culture and sitting at his feet. We move into the power of worship. Six days before the Passover began, Jesus went back to Bethany, the town where he raised Lazarus from the dead. They had prepared a supper for Jesus. Martha served, and Lazarus and Mary were among those at the the table so some time had passed they're back jesus has come back now i want you to notice this this was six days before passover jesus knew in six days he was going to be hanging on that cross no one had that revelation no one knew anything they didn't understand what was happening Jesus had come back to his best friend's home and again, again, he is there and they're waiting on the people and then in the middle again, Jesus being honored, people sitting around him, Mary goes into her room, picks up an alabaster jar filled with nearly a liter of extremely rare and costly perfume go on the web and read about costly perfume today oh my goodness You, you can't imagine how much a bottle of rare and costly perfume mary goes and she gets that and it's the purest extract of nard and she again breaks culture gets down on her knees he is seated she is down before him breaks that alabaster box over his feet fragrance fills the room immediately judas says that could have been saved and spent we could have fed the poor and done so much with it jesus says this leave her alone she has saved it for the time of my burial there is no question that mary had such a heart for jesus and a love for him for what had happened into her life that it didn't make any difference whether she pleased people she was going to be a worshiper we have got to learn again we we've got to have the teaching of the word do you you know it's it grieves my heart sometimes but you know many people when it comes to the bible they they don't know they couldn't show you the book of isaiah 
Hosea. I mean, I mean, I've had people ask me, uh, is that in the New Testament or Old Testament? Okay. And, I, and I'm, not, I'm not speaking down or making fun in any way. It's that because we don't have, we don't use a Bible. We don't use a Bible. It's funny, I had somebody got up, got up one day. One of my professors said, all right, everybody, turn to the book of Hezekiah. I mean, we were all just digging through there, man. Where the heck is Hezekiah? You know, we could, and you know, he goes, yeah, that's what I thought, you know. <laughs> or everybody turned to the book of Concordance. I mean, it, it's really funny, you know. But the point being, you got to have the word, but then you've got to be the worshiper. Man, I love what Jack Hayford said. Worship changes the worshiper into the image of the one worshiped wow man that's something you need to hang on to as i worship i'm being changed into the image as we we can all come out of different generations god so i came out of rock and roll my lord and and during those early days gosh you would dress like them look like them wear your hair like them i mean it was sing their songs you know that's you you we act music is such a powerful tool and heaven knows that uh, how powerful that tool is but as we begin to worship and no matter in any area we become the one we worship we are transformed into the one we worship. But can I tell you something? There's not one person who can keep you from becoming just like Jesus. Nobody can do that. Because you know why? I am the resurrection and I am the life. I'm the resurrection at 1120, but it's 1121. I'm the life. I am everything you need right now. What do we learn from this story here about Mary? Mary's love was personal and it was intentional. This was her treasure to give and nobody else. Jesus always sees what is personal and what is intentional. The treasure could have been an inheritance uh, it could have been no doubt something very very precious to her and it was personal and it was intentional no doubt she fulfilled a prophetic word I'll tell you something about worshipers and people who sit at the word they are far more sensitive to the Holy Spirit and this was something she wanted to give and she broke it and this inheritance cost her something you know how many know it's easy to give something when it doesn't cost you anything i sat with a group of pastors one day it's pretty funny I, and i told them i was going to buy i'm buying everybody's dinner and uh the waiter came up we were talking to the waiter and this and that and one of the pastors said oh you are so good we're going to give you a really big tip I looked at him and I said, are you paying or I'm paying? And, of course, everybody burst out laughing, you know. Why? How I many know it's so easy to give somebody else's money? It's simple. But when you give it out of your pocket and when you give something out of you that's personal, it means something. It means something to Jesus. Here's a statement I want to make. We will always smash lesser love to acquire a greater one. We always will. And the last, how do we live the resurrected life? It's going to come through the power of faith. It is the power of his word, the power of our worship, and the power of our faith. Jesus, in a town he was preaching, they came to him and they said, Lazarus, the one whom you love, he is super sick, you're going to have to leave. And Jesus intentionally ignored it. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to that later. 
one day pass, two day pass, then three day pass. And then finally, you know, Jesus says, let's go and I'm going to raise Lazarus from sleep. Now, do y'all know I love the way the Bible talks about death? Jesus so many times, ah, you're just asleep. Those graveyards are just asleep. There's nothing going to hold that body down. And so here the story is. We find it over in the book of John. And when Martha heard that Jesus was approaching the village, she went out to meet him. Mary stayed in the house, and Martha said to Jesus, My Lord, if only you had come sooner, my brother wouldn't have died. But I know that if you were to ask God for anything, he would, he would do it for you. Jesus told her, Your brother shall rise and live. And she replied yes i know he's going to rise when everyone rises on resurrection day martha you don't have to wait until then i am the resurrection and i am the life eternal and anyone who clings to me in faith even though he dies, will live forever, and the one who lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Wow. And she goes into the fact that, Lord, it's been four days. He stinketh. I've said that about sometimes my children. Thus saith the Lord, they stinketh. <laughs> Jesus looked at her and said, Didn't I just tell you that if you believe in me, you will see God unveil his power? That is a word for us. That is a word for every one of you right now. Oh, for what God is saying to our hearts. So Jesus told them, Get that stone and move it out of, the, out of the way. They moved it out of the way. Jesus gazed up in heaven and said, Father, I want to thank you. This is really the place where Jesus wept. And, you know, you can theologically go all over that. We don't know why he wept. It could have been the fact that he had taught and ministered so much and they just did not see and understand the revelation and what he had and the fact that he's got to turn it over to them in just a few days. But everything that Jesus, here's the point, everything Jesus did in Lazarus was just a foreshadow of what was to happen. This was what he was explaining and showing them. This is going to happen. You're going to see this. And there's going to come another day I'm going to be the one rising from the dead and you're going to be rising with me they rolled the heavy stone away Jesus gazed into heaven and said Father thank you that you've heard my prayer you listen to every word that I speak now so that those who stand here with me will believe that you have sent me on this earth as a messenger I will use the power you have given me and then with a loud voice, Jesus didn't go, Lazarus. No, man, he shouted. And you know what? The Bible says he shouted. Guess what's going to happen when he comes back? Do y'all know he's coming with a shout? Lazarus, come forth. I don't doubt when he splits the sky that he says, let the church arise. And bam, hallelujah, come out of that tomb. Now, he was laying in the back of the tomb. That, that body started bouncing up to the top, <laughs> bounced right in the door. And then, you know what he said, loose him and let him go. The word of the Lord for us today Jesus is saying, loose them, let them go. Holy Spirit is in you. His love, 
Pastor Terry, I am believing that this will happen out here in the future. No, 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 no. He is the resurrection. He is the life now. He is here for us now. He is the resurrection. He is the life. He is the resurrection. He is the life. He is the resurrection. And he is your life. He's the resurrection and he is your life. Hallelujah. Say it with me. He's my resurrection and he is my life. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Steve, bring, bring your group up here. Steve's going to minister a beautiful song. Mark, go ahead and...